This is me on a typical morning. I'm quite an optimistic person. I work in software development uh, in a project-driven environment. Um, even though we try, I can seldom reuse an approach twice. Perhaps you know that feeling. Different customers, different problems, different environments expect different solutions. You know how it is. I'm a computer scientist by education, but nowadays I'm mostly the utility man in my company. Um, if, I, if things jam, I have to find the reason of the mystery so that we can find a solution. Often uh, it is expected this, this solution is a quick one because the problem is hindering other things in moving forward, the classic impediment stuff. So this is me when I'm handing, uh, I'm, I'm handed uh, one of these problems, as recently happened. Uh, of course I like my job, so uh, I get cracking at the problem right away. Uh, this time it was a bug report where nobody really knew uh, what the intention of the feature was in the first place. So I tried to reproduce it first, of course. This is really exciting. Huh? This is the stuff, this uh, Sherlock Holmes stuff. Uh, you're remembering the details from the past. Yeah? Looking at the code that only few can understand. Create a theory based on the observed facts. I like this. I like this really much. Um, at one point in time, I find the clue, and I want to trace it back to the origins. I even find the developer who did this, and he's available, and I can ask him, why did you do this? And of course, I get the typical answer, I don't know anymore, but I documented that somewhere. That is from the time where we thought, you just need to document it, yeah? and the problems will be solved. Because everybody, of course, reads every day everything that got documented. Fine, I say. I start the search in our ticket system. You probably would also. And I get over 9,000 results there. That is because searches in tickets, in wiki pages, in contacts, in documents, and in code change sets. And we never throw anything away in our ticket system. That's when my job begins to hurt. I look through the tickets, and I get uh, reminded of wonderful projects we did 10 years ago, and not so wonderful projects we did 15 years ago, because we never throw anything away, of course, and it feels similar to surfing the social media for hours and hours without getting any work done. On good days, I remind myself that I should come up with a quick solution. On bad days, my uh, colleagues have to remind me. Uh, so I give up the issue tracker and uh, get back to the job. So there is also this lessons learned database we have. Huh? This is this good practice approach. After our project, uh, get back with the team, discuss what went good, what went wrong, document that, make a tag this stuff, and, and so that you can find it with the next project. Uh, I don't find anything there. And then there's, of course, this docs folder in all the uh, Python eggs we have. Every Python egg has its doc folder, and there might be documentation in there. Um, and there's nothing there. And where do I find it in the end? Um, I find it in an email thread that has been saved to a folder into the shared drive in the project folder. And that's when I feel really, really tired. By now, I have groomed our ticket system. I have revived my knowledge of ancient projects and made a note to remind a customer to upgrade his software. I have remembered some long forgotten lessons learned, made a note of using the lessons learned more often. I found out about uh, documentation hidden in Python packages I never knew of. And I made a note to move that documentation somewhere where it can be found. And I got lost in the shared drive folder structure again, and I made a big note to finally get rid of that shared drive once and for all. What I've not done is solve my mystery quickly. Why? Because I got sidetracked. There are too many systems that contain information, and you need to know something about each of them to find information. And you get so much irrelevant 
collateral damage or information, if you will, that it becomes increasingly harder to process and filter out what you don't need. You lose focus and you forget more and more the original problem you wanted to tackle. And of course, this is not just about me, but everybody in the company has this problem. Hands up if you know that feeling. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> Let me jump aside. Intranet, that's the talk, what that, uh, that's about. Um, what is an intranet? I guess there are as many definitions outside than intranet. And uh, a very common one is an intranet is an internal website that helps a company to get things done. Wow. Yeah. Uh, nobody says how this is being done. Classical definition, this is 20 years old, I think, from step two designs. Task, typical tasks of an intranet is uh, content. You put stuff there, manuals, guidelines. Communication, that's not between people. Eh? That's your company communicates to the staff members. Interaction, you can find your travel expense forms, fill them, file them, send them. Collaboration, you have the shared workspaces where you can actually put stuff uh, so that everybody sees it, can download it, work on it, put new versions. And then there's this cultural, uh, we have a space where people can organize their company marathon. In reality, if you look at how intranets are implemented, they are often centrally steered. Uh, sometimes you even see job, an um, uh, job adverts for an intranet editor. That means you have people in the company who are actually creating content for the intranet so that other people can digest that. Uh, so they often only do the first two items, content and communication. And also this communication is done without emotion. Huh? Look at Coca-Cola on their website. You don't, you don't really get many facts, but you get lots of emotions. Yeah? And if you look at this and you are an employee of Coca-Cola, you immediately get proud that you work for that company. But if you look at the Coca-Cola intranet, you get newsletters in PDF sent by email. So how does communication actually happen in a company? If you have seven staff members, clear, they meet at the coffee machine. You do not have to facilitate that, uh, or, or you facilitate it by putting a coffee machine, right? If you have 14 staff members, you already need two coffee machines. And they are probably even on two floors. So you already start to getting things like the people from second floor. They're not naming them by name anymore. It's them and us. Yeah? So you need to start facilitating that. In Scrum methodology, you have Scrum of Scrums. So you have your Scrum Master who meets with his seven people team, talks about stuff, and then the day after, he meets with the Scrum Master of the other team and they talk. You have hierarchy. Yeah? Of course, details are lost. And if I talk with him, and afterwards have to tell you what we talked about, I never get the whole message across. What happens with 140 people? They are not in the same building anymore. They are even in a different city, perhaps in a different country. You have time zone problems. Imagine people in Spain and in, in Tokyo. Yeah? Uh, somebody sends something. I know the, the response comes there. And, and 140 is not even a big company. Yeah? This is not even a middle-sized company. This is a small, middle-sized company. So, so companies usually start to try to facilitate that. And if you now ask people in a company, for example, before you start introducing an internet, what do you wish for? What would you like to have if we now introduce an internet? Very, very often, the same wishes come up more communication down the chain of command. People in the company want to do what is good for the company, but to do this, they need to know what's good for the company. Understanding of strategic decisions. I don't know what's happening up there. Yeah? As I said before, people from second floor, people up there, you don't even say my, my board of directors. Yeah? It's the people up there, the big heads. Feeling to be detached from company communication. And these are serious problems. And that's the actual challenge to solve. Do we employ humans or machines? If you think you can facilitate communication by technology, 
you're talking about machines, but you employ people. Uh, um, currently, um, studies vary a bit, but people spend between 20 and 30 percent searching for information. Uh, that means you hire five people, four of them are in the company, one is perf permanently out searching for something. What we need is a simple internet, an internet that allows you to find information quickly so that you can focus on your task at hand. I'm, I'm jumping again now, yeah? so please bear with me. I'm touching different topics to draw them together later on. Um, we are here because we all work with Plone. So I want to look at this from the Plone angle for a moment. Um, Plone is quite good out of the box. You can make some small adjustments. If you use it as it is, um, you can uh, solve many, many different problems. Um, and as long as you don't start adapting it uh, completely, it's, it's a, an, incre in, uh, an incredibly powerful uh, tool. Um, with that power comes complexity. I want that at a, at a next step, at a higher scale. I want, I want a flexibility like Plone, um, which is easy to use for people in that internet scale. Plone is also really good at um, if you have a new UI and use Plone as a backend. All that development with headless Plone, Plone server, Guillotina, go in that direction. Um, people have realized a few years ago that customizing the Plone user interface is not that simple to do. So paths have gone into that direction to make a new user interface. Huh? Um, but UI is a project on its own. And the downside is you have less reusability the more and more customer specific you build that. Plone is not so good at intensive change of the UI, consistent experience between add-ons. Plone is new UI framework, UI platform. It's not Plone's fault. That's not what Plone is built for. Yeah? So we cannot blame that actually on Plone. And complexity is an issue if you go for intranets. As you said eight years ago, um, I made this open space at the conference and I tried to identify what is it that makes an internet. And I asked into, into, the, um, into the round, uh, please come up, what do you think are the uh, best or the, the necessary add-ons for an internet? That time I thought in we just take plomb, put in add-ons and call it internet. And then we wanted to uh, prioritize that. And we ended up with 23 add-ons, I think, after half an hour, even more. And we couldn't even agree what is more important. Um, that was also, I love this anecdote of the first meeting for Plone Internet, where we had uh, five companies in the room and found out that we had six implementations of workspaces from these five companies. So complexity is an issue. I'm talking a bit about uh, the difference between Microsoft and Apple in that case, um, without trying to get too polemic. Um, this is similar like, to this traveling salesman problem. Uh, who knows that problem? Uh, not many, so. Um, one of the really hard issues in computer science is um, you imagine a, a salesman who has to visit different cities in a country and um, you want to find the shortest path. And the more cities you put, the harder it, it, it explodes exponentially, the harder it becomes to keep control and to find out what is actually the shortest path. And that's the same here. If we add 20 cities or 20 add-ons, yeah, we, cannot, we cannot say we cannot control this anymore. Um, if we take Plone alone, that works fine. If we take Plone, install more and more add-ons, the complexity grows into the uncontrollable. And so what we want is take Plone, control the UI and the add-ons, and make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Microsoft alone, if you install Windows, it's actually quite stable. Huh? But if you install third-party drivers, third-party software, third-party add-ons, third-party whatever, it starts crashing. It is actually not really Microsoft's fault, unless you blame Microsoft for being so open. And everybody is praising Apple, but Apple is it's just being restrictive. Huh? Say, OK, we only have these handful of, of options. And it will work as soon as we stick with these handful of options. So we need to do something uh, similar. Are people in need of an internet? I strongly believe so, uh, be especially if you're more than seven people. Do people know that they are? No. 
do people want to work with an internet? Hell no, they have to work with an internet. Usually they have other tasks. Yeah? Internet is not the task you want, want to, to concern yourself with. So we need to change that problem by giving them a good experience. It needs to be, it needs not to be nice to work with the internet. If they don't really realize that they work with the internet, yeah, we have achieved the task. How do we give a good experience? Many add-ons, fancy design, high configurability? No. Good experience is always simple, reduced, effective, quick, intuitive. If you don't really uh, see or if it don't really hinders you, it's good. So that's how we did internets in the past. Yeah? It's like Plone is the beach, and then we stacked add-on onto add-on onto add-on, and when we were done and thought we have them all, we put some lipstick on the pick, some design that's the leaves of the palm, yeah, to kind of make it work together. But every add-on is programmed for a certain task. And that add-on is not programmed to work with the other add-ons. Yeah? So they employ different concepts, different ideas, different uh, front-end, different control structures. So what we actually want is one of these cool pyramids that can fly into space. Yeah? They are consistent. Everything is in place where it should. And somewhere inside, in that engine, there are the add-ons that make it possible. But I believe that this pyramid has been designed first and then made to fly. So I make another jump. Now I try to position Plone Internet. Um, once from the uh, target group, so there are the developers, there are the end users. Where does Plone Internet fit in in that uh, dimension? And the software. Um, I'd say Plone is a platform that allows you to do really many things with it. And then you have this product concept where you have exactly one software for one given task. And uh, you can use that multiple times. Um, software platform means I want to be as flexible as possible, as little constraints as possible. I want a generic structure that fits most use cases. That's what Plone is really good at. Huh? They discuss a lot and think how could that work together to not close any paths in the future? Configurable slots to allow change, and the emphasis is placed on extendability, configurability. The product, on the other side, means you usually have a design that's created with users in mind to solve a certain task, and you reduce complexity. Yeah? You, if you do some software as a service in the internet, usually you can do one thing and you are getting soon a little bit angry that you can do more stuff that you've come up with. Um, in Naples, many years ago in the conference, there was actually a talk about how to strip down Plone, to remove stuff that confuses people. Yeah, it's a wonderful task for the uh, talk for that time. Um, I was, at that time, I was surprised that somebody would want to do this. Yeah. Um, an emphasis is put on a given feature set, control, maintainability. The other vector, um, developer versus users, end users. Uh, for developer, usually say develop first, then make it nice. This is typically done when you have many developers and few designers. And you put a big emphasis on solid backend architecture, reusability, stability. Target group end user means make it nice, then develop for it. And this is typically done when you have many designers and few developers. But the emphasis is put on the end user. So I tried to put a graph together, how I think we position. Uh, Plone is clearly a platform for developers, mainly, even though you can use it for uh, a lot of tasks right out of the box. Typically, when you um, want to use it for a bigger project, you have to adapt heavily. I see WordPress in the top left um, pack because um, it has become a platform. It's really extensible, and it's really user-friendly to get started. Um, there are internet products like Jostle, Thought Farmer, Bitrix, which I see more on the product side. Jostle, for example, you cannot, it's really hard to adapt anything. It basically tells you how to use it. Um, but it's also extremely user-friendly. And I see Plone Internet quite in the middle here, but clearly on the designer and user side. So I mentioned design first, and to make it really, really clear what I'm talking about, design first puts the end user first, and we do not compromise on that. 
So what is this design first process? That means that a product owner, designer, and even developer sit together and detail the requirements for a new feature. And then the design produces the clickable prototype. We need that because we can use the clickable prototype to test with the users whether we actually have understood the problem. And we assume that we have not understood the problem the first time. Stakeholders, um, developers, all give their input, and you can adjust again. This is very cheap because the prototype does not have involved any programming yet. Uh, we also use patterns in JavaScript to easily create uh, uh, interactivity there, so there is normally no programming involved. And then when the prototype is accepted, it is passed to developers as a specification. Yeah? We are also not writing big papers as specification. Um, because developers usually can see 90% of what they have to do from the prototype, what they have to deliver. It's really clear what has to come out. Huh? And uh, when development starts, the designers are even helping the developers to understand what was meant. They check what the developers have implemented. See, look, there's something wrong. I see that immediately. The developer says, oh, I don't see anything. Yes, yes, here. And it turns out it's actually a completely misunderstood function. This has benefits and challenges. Benefits. A lot of the interaction is already done in the front end. The design prototype is already directly the Diazo theme. So if a change or a fix is in prototype, we just put it over into the Diazo theme and it's uh, active. The biggest benefit is designers and developers talk more. I should, make, I should have made that bold. Uh, I think designers and developers talk different languages. Yeah. And you get real good products if you uh, have a translator in between or if you can make them learn the other's language. And of course, the result is much closer to the user because uh, designers usually don't care at all what we develop. And the developer's focus moves back to the back end because if you have a developer that starts to design, he is distracted from sound backends. Challenges. Developers don't design anymore. Some developers hate that. Yeah. Um, and the challenge is really designers and developers have to talk together. This is underestimated, I, I think. Um, we often have terminology issues where a developer uses the same word as a designer, but they mean completely different problem domains. Um, and of course, design decisions can have an impact on the backend architecture. The designer does something in the prototype and it's perfectly quick. And the developer sees, um, damn it, I have to do a server round trip for this. I have to do calculations. This is not completing in 100 milliseconds. Um, and if I tell the designer that the designer has, well, but then make it in 100 milliseconds. <laughs> and uh, then you need to actually translate again between the languages. And now I have jumped so much in my, in my topics, I can jump again. Back to social intranets. Um, with one of my first slides where I said an intranet is a software that helps a company to get a job done, a social intranet is an intranet that helps people to get the job done. I love this definition because it's not such a big thing. Social intranet is used as a buzzword a lot, but it basically means it puts people in focus again. Yeah? Less functionality, more people. And this is also connected to the fact that the people in your company usually know what's best. Yeah? If you put too many uh, functionality, too many technology up uh, to support them, you might even hinder them in doing their job. That's also a nice one. That's actually from the Thought Farmer blog. Social Internet, connect every piece of information to a living, breathing person. And make the information human. No? We need two simple things for that. Real people need to create that content, and the content needs to be connected to the people. So you read a document, and you know immediately who did it. So you can get in contact. Um, what is the biggest mistake when migrating an intranet or into an intranet? An admin does it. He takes the data on the shared drive, imports it, usually with the admin account, so all the content is owned by admin. Yeah doesn't work. 
like I said, aspects for the uh, normal internet. We also has aspects have aspects of a social internet. Uh, typical things in there, personalized dashboard, news feeds, video, document libraries, activity streams, group representation, staff profiles, mobile. And if you look at the document libraries by um, thinking of documents that are written by people, then every point here includes people, includes human stuff, right? The social internet turns a static information library into a lively forum of, for information. That's a goal. Help people to exchange information because they know which information is relevant. Actually, uh, there's a nice example. You know uh, multifunction copy machines? Who has a multifunction copy machine at his office? You know these huge things? You, know, you, you can copy stuff with a small one, but they are huge. I think people assume this is because they have a lot of paper inside. But they are called multifunction copy machines because they have multiple functions. In a, quite a big company, they introduced an intranet, and they also did a, a video uh, sharing platform in there so that employees could record videos. And they also had a trending feature. And um, shortly after they launched that, one video was trending for weeks. And that video was a minute or so, showing how to use this stapling function, yeah, where you can uh, clip multiple papers together on that multifunction copy machine. And they thought, of course, like, our oh, trending feature is broken. Why would something like that trend? Yeah. Um, and they investigated. They didn't find any bug in the system. And uh, then they looked at the logs, like who is asking for that video? Uh, do we really have hits for this video? Yes, they have. All over the company, in different countries, people were looking at that video. And they were asking some people, like, why did you watch that video? And they said, because it helps. <laughs> and they found that everybody in the company got the printer manual by email when they bought these multifunction printers in every office. That manual was also available in the IT section, in the IT project folder, somewhere under machines stuff where you could access it. They even printed a manual and you know put it on a on a chain and it hang down at the printer, yeah? So that nobody takes it away and it's always available. But still, apparently, nobody in that company knew how to use that function. Because how does that look? Yeah? You want to copy something, and you stand beside the copy machine, and you're reading that manual, <laughs> and somebody comes in, perhaps the intern, yeah? <laughs> and it looks like you're not able to copy something. Nobody does that. Yeah? And you just see that video, and you read it, and it provides you an immediate benefit because you are copying stuff all the time and you are do making handouts for your meetings and stapling them is such a better experience and it saves you this half an hour to sort or, 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 or staple yourself. Yeah? So it, if, you, if you take that on the company and, and five minutes saved for every meeting, yeah, that's a substantial amount of money and probably co-finances the new intranet immediately. Uh, I have talked enough, I think. Let me give you a quick video on how Quave looks.
lot of people in the foreground. So I hope that some of you now have this question in your mind and want to try it out. Before I answer that, I have to say a few things about Plone Internet. We have this consortium. This is a loose association of Plone companies who have been at one point involved into developing this. They are committing to sharing and the design first approach. Um, the financing of design and quality assurance is uh, shared. Any company can basically join as long as they commit to this approach and working in these companies and on the project is still in a project-centric fashion. People always ask why are there two editions? We have Plone Internet and we have Quave, the brand name. Um, I have put a lot of emphasis during this talk on the design first approach. This is because it needs protection. This is no free for all. If you not follow the design first approach, the whole thing will bloat and it will not work anymore. There is actually no black magic under the hood. The real jewel in that project is the design approach. The project-based work model conflicts with a product-based work model. That means um, we need to make sure that everything stays consistent so that it becomes a product even though we work on it as a project. And if we don't sustain this product, it will become yet another unsupported add-on. And that's something we definitely want to avoid because we have fought with that for 10 years. Still all is fully GPL. So we decided for a delayed release cycle, like closed betas, we develop a new functionality. And when we are confident that we have a coherent thing, we release that as one out again. So there is this, what we call Plone Internet, the community edition. You can find information on that also on Quave.com. Version 1.2 is just around the corner. We'll release probably the moment that Plone 5.1 is out. Uh, it has new apps, tons of small improvements, speed ups, and latest Plone. And the design first approach. And there is Quave Social Internet, which is the version that we uh, support Officially, it's targeted at the enterprise market. That's how we try to refinance the effort. But we basically focus on support and service. It is the same software. It's just a bit more cutting edge. And um, we implement new features through the classical blown approach by customization product, uh, projects. However, we are also quite hard with our customers by trying to understand their requirements and see how can they be applied in a generic way so that they are actually useful for others. Uh, things in Quave, not in the current Plone intranet, are products, milestones, notifications, concurrent editing. Uh, our taxonomy browser is actually going now out. SlideBank, audit lock. LDAP Active Directory is also being published now. Apparently, I didn't remove that. Migration support. Within the consortium, we also offer um, Consulting, because introducing an intranet is not just installing a software. So we have a consulting offer. We try to understand the organization, develop an information architecture, deliver Quave, then analyze the impact and help on improving it. Roadmap 1.1 came out last spring. 1.2 is just about to get out now. So we are able to uh, maintain our plan of six month releases, it seems. Um, you can already see the features in the upcoming release uh, blog post on Quave.com. And so the 1.3, if all goes well, is planned for next spring. We are working on some uh, amazing features, I think, now. We have the concurrent editing of Office documents using only Office that I uh, showed in the lightning talk yesterday. That's just about being completed. Uh, we are looking into Zapier integration so that you can connect your internet with external systems. Um, we want to have a nice notification center that you can really tune where you get emails, where you get notifications in the system, um, together with a push notification so that you can also get notifications on your mobile device, and a legal contracts app where you can see all the contracts that your company has with um, providers. If you want to know more, please get in touch. We are happy for every question. Um, you can book a demo online, 
so I can actually guide you through the system or one of my colleagues. Um, we have a mailing list you can subscribe to. It's a very low uh, impact one. You can just send us a note if you want. Um, we have a free playground where you can play on the latest versions. Of course, just mail me. And that's the web address again. Please get in touch. Thanks a lot. And in case I didn't say it clear enough, it just doesn't work if you don't do the design first approach. Thanks a lot. We have uh, several minutes for questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, I want to raise a question. Um, is this the traditional monolithic approach for internet still a decent solution? Because lots of companies nowadays are moving to a more diverse structure like using Slack for communication, or at least in tools like Jira or Confluence, and they're pretty productive with that. With that. How, is your, how do you place Quave against these technologies? Or are you better, or what's your selling point? Um, the selling point is actually the simplicity. Um, as you mentioned, Jira. People who have seen Jira usually have a need to reduce complexity again. Um, and we are not targeting uh, highly technical companies who, for example, need a tracker like this. Um, so uh, typically, the feedback when we do a demonstration is either Oh, there are many things you can do with Quave. Yeah? Uh, that's not uh, powerful enough for us. Or we get the other side, like, wow, I immediately understand what I have to do. This will drastically reduce my training efforts. So we are aiming for that second part, where you actually need an internet that does not distract you from your main task. And that al also means um, that we do it uh, Pareto style. We are aware and willing to only implement 80% of functionality, perhaps. That means we are alienating some power users, but we are doing it just right for the main part of the company um, to actually get the basic stuff done easily. Um, however, we see the need for some additional stuff. That's the reason why we're looking into Zapier integration. Uh, if this, then that is also an, an, an option. And we want to open up more uh, API for that. But this is not something that is happening really quickly. It's so not our main priority. Does that answer your question? More questions? Okay. Um, if I want to, to uh, implement a customer-specific app for your intranet, uh, what's the way to do it? Is it a uh, uh, React uh, application, or, or how do I implement customer-specific apps? Um, basically, this is Plown. So you do browser views. You use um, patterns, mock-up patterns, for your user interface. Um, and and uh, deploy that as an add-on package. So you could have Plone Internet installed and your own custom app installed, and then you do a, 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 a setup uh, profile that installs your package and installs the nice tile yeah, with your icon on it, and it would link to your browser view. We have a little bit of a framework in place for apps. So there is base classes you can inherit from so that it behaves prop uh, properly. Apps are containers so that you can store information in them. And there is uh, the Plone Internet API so that you have access to the user profiles, to the graphs, to the chat, uh, not chat, to the uh, social sub-level and so on. And of course, ideally, you would join us and go also through the designer to do this. But nothing is forcing it. Test. Uh, well, two things. One was I wanted to comment on the definitions. I didn't see one of the earlier 
conceptual definitions of intranet, extranet, which was in the early 90s, which is just intra means, okay, internal communications, extra means out there. Uh, and the other one was, I, I mean, I'm working on a, or I have a site where to do our intranet, basically what we did is we said, all right, you're from there, you've got this address, you're in that group. Uh, and then otherwise we manually add people into groups who are using, of course, the permissions and all. Uh, is your system using similar uh, functions or, or just how do you attach who's in the internet, who's in which department, things like that? Um, the second question is about how you manage users and workspaces and yeah. assign. Uh, well, I, yeah? I didn't get the first one. Well, the first one is uh, the first one is intranet, extranet. Yeah? Intranet and extranet, by definition, yeah. in the early 90s was simply intra, meaning internal, yeah. and extra, meaning external. Yeah. I didn't know about the other definitions of, uh, um, I don't know, it's a thing. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I think oh, it's a net thing, yeah. 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 Right. Um, I think um, uh, this definition um, kind of tries to capture what that intranet should actually solve in terms of issues. I think that is, um, that is in addition to intra and extra because you can do these jobs for internal people and for external people, of course. And we're actually looking into ways how you can uh, properly invite external users even temporarily into the intranet so that they can be managed in the same communication context. Um, but that's a different story. And uh, the other one is um, you can quite easily um, create workspaces. This is like plus pick which type of security context you want create, and then you have a members tab, and then you just add members. Um, in Plone, you can do permissioning everywhere, on every object, down to the last little thing. And we think this is way too complex for normal users, because they only see that they don't have access to a document, and they cannot really understand why. So we are abstracting that, reducing that a bit, so you are setting permission levels on the workspace. Like, you have editor rights here, he has viewer rights, and that group, that marketing group, has uh, moderator rights, for example. And then this is inherited to everything down below, um, so that people can actually say, okay, I have one place to look for what, what I am able to do. It's also good to audit who can see what. And then I know this is valid for everything within that workspace. And that's quite easy. There's a user picker, a user picker, group picker. You can look up these groups in the contacts app and know who is in there, and then assign roles, and that's it. Um, so everything what Plone can, basically, but we throw a lot of stuff away. Time's up. One last question. Um, my question uh, is, did you ever run into scalability issues? And I'm specifically asking for like write-heavy parts of uh, Plone intranet. So uh, I mean, the idea of a social intranet is that people interact a lot. And um, if they like create a lot, lots of posts, and you have lots of concurrent users and then comments, um, did you run into such problems? And what was like, uh, I mean, how many users do you, like what, was the, what were the largest like uh, numbers of users that, that worked for? The uh, largest installation that we have has um, something about uh, 5,000 users. Um, it varies a lot, and uh, they are certainly not all active all the time. Uh, there is a core of 150 to 200 people who are active all the time. That's um, the customer Starlines, so they are organized in this decentral way. Starlines is providing information and coordination services for the carriers, for the 28 carriers. So um, this team of 150 to 200 people are all the time creating content, pushing that out to the others in the carriers, and they come eventually and read that information. Um, we do not have uh, any problems at all with that. It is actually even much quicker than the old Plone only solution. Um, but that is certainly also due to, um, we do a lot of things asynchronously. Um, we use uh, what formerly was Plone Social as the base for commenting and the activity stream, which is highly performant. Um, and it is not typical that many people work on the same thing at the same time. So it's nicely spread all over the place. And um, for this setup, we have, I think, six virtual machines for frontends installed, for Zope frontends, and 
one for Zero, one for Zola, one for Celery, one for LDAP, for, for the other services. And uh, we don't, basically don't see any um, right conflicts. Thanks, Alex. Thank you all for coming. Okay.